our Jurist in Residence lecture, Preserving a Fair and Impartial Judiciary. We're fortunate tonight to have our current Jurist in Residence, Judge Susan Schwab, who was an alum of the first graduating class of our law school here in Harrisburg and was the class valedictorian. So we're very excited to have her here. Judge Schwab was appointed magistrate judge for the United States District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania in 2012. She assumed the role of chief magistrate judge of the United States District Court on January 4th, 2017. She spent 11 years in public service with the Commonwealth as deputy chief counsel for the Auditor General, deputy chief counsel and deputy state treasurer for administration for treasury, and deputy chief of staff for administration, deputy chief counsel for the Democratic, Democratic Caucus of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Prior to that, Judge Schwab was in private law practice with Rhodes and Sinan here in Harrisburg and Semenoff, Ormsby, Greenberg, and Torcha in Harrisburg, uh, and in, excuse me, in Huntington Valley. Please join me in welcoming Judge Schwab. Thank you, Dean Johnson. There's a lot of deputies in that bio. I, I don't know. <laughs> Before uh, we uh, begin, I, I want to express my gratitude to Dean Johnson for choosing me as the jurist in residence. Uh, my tenure is coming to a close, and I just wanted to say uh, what a wonderful experience this has been to be associated with the law school in this way. And I'm sure the members of my distinguished panel, all of whom have spent time in academia, would attest that being in the classroom with the students has been most gratifying. What Dean Johnson didn't say about my background is I did teach the eighth and the ninth grade right out of uh, um, college. And uh, I could tell you it's much better teaching law school. <laughs> renews your hope uh, to teach these wonderful students in the uh, future of our, our colleagues. I also want to thank the Law and Government Institute and recognize this law school's commitment to training future government lawyers and instilling in them a, a profound sense of government service. As Dean Johnson said, the title of our discussion here tonight is Preserving a Fair and Impartial Judiciary. And we shall be discussing this topic tonight with some of the most distinguished jurists in our commonwealth and with Widener's own Professor Domino. I want to e express my gratitude to the panel for taking the time from their busy lives to join us. And I want to introduce them to you. But let me just say, if I really read all their bios, that would take up the whole hour, and uh, we wouldn't get any anything uh, discussed. Let me introduce, introduce my friend and colleague, Judge John Jones. Judge Jones is at the end of the table there. Judge Jones is the 21st judge to sit in the United States District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. He was born and raised in Schuylkill County, and he is a graduate of the Dickinson School of Law of the Penn State University. In 1980, Judge Jones began his legal career as a law clerk to the President Judge of Schuylkill County, the Honorable Guy A. Bowie. Subsequently, he engaged in the private practice of law in Pottsville, and in May of 1995, Governor Ridge nominated Judge Jones to serve as chairman of the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. We have Justice David Wecht with us. He's second uh, from my left here. Justice Wecht was elected to a 10-year term on the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania in November of 2015, and he began his service as a Supreme Court Justice in January of 2016. Justice Wecht served as a judge of the Superior Court of Pennsylvania from January 2012 to January 2016, and as a judge on the Court of Common Pleas for Pennsylvania's 5th Judicial District from February 2003 to January 2012. From January 2009 to January 2011, Justice Weck served by appointment of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania as administrative judge of the 5th Judicial District's Family Division, which encompasses both domestic relation cases and cases of juvenile dependency. Prior to taking the bench, Justice Wecht was twice elected as Allegheny County's Register of Wills and Clerk of Orphans Court. Justice Wecht is a 1984 graduate of the Yale Law School. We have with us Judge Caroline Mahalchik. The Honorable Caroline Mahalchik is a United States Magistrate Judge appointed to the bench of the United States District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania, 
on July 15, 2013. Prior to entering on duty with the court, she was in private practice, where she represented a broad range of clients in both state and federal trial and appellate courts, including the United States Supreme Court. She is a graduate of the Tulane University School of Law. And finally, last but not least, we have Professor Michael Domino, one of your own here. Uh, Professor Domino teaches courses related to constitutional law, election law, federal courts, statutory interpretation, and criminal law. Professor Domino graduated from the Harvard Law School in 2001. Professor Domino served as chief clerk to Associate Judge Albert Rosenblatt of the New York State Court of Appeals and then clerk for Senior Circuit Judge Lawrence Silberman of the United States Courts of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and Judge Paul Friedman of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. I want to thank my panel uh, for coming here tonight. There are so many tentacles to a discussion of judicial independence that we could not possibly cover them all in the hour that we have tonight. I am going to leave time at the end for questions because I do think this is a topic where students and lawyers that are in our audience tonight might have questions. Um, so many times in panel discussions of this sort, we get to the end and there's no time for the audience. So I really uh, encourage you to save your questions for the end and we're going to leave some good time for that. But for the students among us who may not who may be you know, new to the law school environment, not be totally aware of what we're talking about, let me begin with some basic parameters. The Code of Conduct for Federal Judges states in Canon 1, which is entitled, A Judge Should Uphold the Integrity and Independence of the Judiciary, states that an independent and honorable judiciary is indispensable to justice in our society. A judge should maintain and enforce a high, high standards of conduct and should personally observe those standards so that the integrity and independence of the judiciary may be served, preserved. The Pennsylvania Code of Judicial Conduct canons similarly state, a judge shall uphold and promote the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary and shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. A judge shall perform the duties of judicial office impartial, impartially, competently, and diligently. A judge shall conduct the judge's personal and extrajudicial activities to minimize the risk of conflict with the obligations of judicial officer. And finally, a judge or candidate for judicial office shall not engage in political or campaign activity that is inconsistent with the independence, integrity, or impartiality of the judiciary. These are the broad parameters with it, within which we're going to discuss today. And, and Judge Jones, I'm going to turn to you first. In 2005, you presided over the landmark case of Kitzmiller versus Dover School District, in which you held that it was unconstitutional to teach intelligent design within a public school science curriculum. Thereafter, in 2014, you resolved the important matter of Whitewood versus Wolf by striking down as unconstitutional Pennsylvania's ban on same-sex marriage. Can you share with us your personal observations that you learned through your involvement with these high-profile cases and, and your other cases um, about what it means to you to be an independent jurist? Well, I'm happy to, and uh, welcome to uh, my fellow panelists, uh, friends uh, uh, all, and it's, it's a, a great privilege to to be with you tonight and with Judge Schwab. And Judge Schwab, I forgot you were the valedictorian. Congratulations oh, again. Oh, I know. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, Thank you. That's quite an honor. Uh, so it's a, it's a great homecoming for you as well. But th through those two cases, which were um, really hot button uh, cases and, and you're featuring you know, the confluence of uh, politics, of uh, religion, of the law, uh, social issues of the day, uh, uh, that uh, that I, re I received randomly, I, I hasten to add, uh, or else there, there's somebody. Uh, yeah, how do you get those good yeah, cases? Yeah, I know. It, it, uh, <laughs> you, you, you think it was by some design, but it's not. Uh, intelligent and, design. And, uh, but, but that's right. That's well, right. What, did, what did you say? What did he say? He no. said intelligent design. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, which, which, that's exactly the right answer. Uh, what, I, what I learned through that, uh, you know, there was a study recently uh, uh, by um, uh, by. 
Professor Domino's uh, alma mater. It was a poll. And even at the f level of the federal judiciary, two thirds of the respondents thought that federal judges uh, decided cases as according to their political background and their political um, biases. And of course, uh, roundly, that's not true. Uh, and, and I'm here to say that it's not true. Uh, but um, that was the expectation of the public. Uh, certainly in the first case, the intelligent design case, and probably to a degree in the second case, that we do one for the home team, the home team being uh, our prior party affiliation, or uh, in my case, the president who appointed me. And I learned that uh, my name had changed uh, from uh, Judge Jones to Bush appointed uh, uh, Judge Jones, which uh, it was very telling. And that happens today. You hear about it all the time. Uh, just uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, in his end of the year statement last year, uh, said there are no Obama judges or, or uh, Clinton judges or Bush judges. Uh, uh, or, for that matter, Trump judges, there are, there are uh, simply uh, federal judges. So uh, what I learned is that the, the, we, the, the, the public has a belief, and it unfortunately gets fueled by the punditry and, and the press, uh, which sometimes is irresponsible, that, that uh, judges, uh, even at the district court level, the trial court level, where I uh, reside and where I work, that there, we're going to decide cases uh, to be true to our uh, presumed school, uh, writing out our obligation to follow the law and precedent and, and the Constitution. And uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, in that area because uh, true judicial independence means that the, you, know, you do uh, your duty and you do your job regardless uh, of, of uh, who appointed you, uh, regardless of, of what uh, you bring to the bench in terms of uh, personal philosophies. And, and it's lamentable. Uh, you know, and it's persistent, and I know tonight we'll talk about some of the ways that we can we can deal with that. You were but, personally but threatened, were you not? By death threats after mm -hmm. the after the intelligent design case, and unfortunately, the death that's threats just by the lawyers. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> right. No, well, no, it, well, no oddly, odd, oddly, just as it came from the evangelical uh, community, uh, uh, who were unhappy with my, uh, ironically, unhappy with my. Uh, uh, decision and it and it triggered uh, U.S. Marshal protection, which which you know uh, you, you you get that and we'll save for later. But you know the, the intensive rhetoric uh, that surrounds uh, judges' decisions, and I don't want to usurp anything. We can talk about this later. Uh, the hot button uh, uh, sort of uh, high blown or, or it's not high blown. It's actually gutter rhetoric. Uh, really is is troubling to me, and I and I think. Uh, we, we could get a judge hurt uh, if we're not careful how we, right. how we deal with these things. J Justice Weck, did, what, playing off what Judge Jones said, you're on the highest uh, appellate court, the oldest appellate court in the country, and you've, you're an elected judge, um, uh, and you've had your share of high-profile cases and have been in the media, the League of Women Voters case, for those who don't know, the League of Women Vos Voters versus Commonwealth case, it, that's the congressional redistricting case, uh, picking up on what Judge Jones said, what, what have you learned about your uh, view on judicial independence after, after going through that experience? Well, uh, you can't be a person of tender sensibilities, and uh, I, I think it's important to, uh, to uh, remember that, uh, that you've put yourself into the public sphere and that uh, criticism is part of it. So, uh, you know, Truman was right. Was it Truman who said, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen? I think it was in, whoever it was. Judge Jones but, is nodding, so I'll you know, take that. So, <laughs> so, you know, whether, whether it's um, in the federal appointed judiciary or the um, state elected judiciary, you need to be uh, a person who's willing to uh, see your name dragged through the mud and, and realize that uh, people have that First Amendment right to criticize you. And um, so um, you mentioned the League of Women Voters case, and um, we don't have time, of course, uh, here in our short session to go into that case, but um, it, it'd be fun for people who are interested in, in thinking about these issues further um, to Google that, Google around with that stuff and, and look at the various articles because, um, which I did, oh, which you yeah. did and, and some of you might've done. So four of us, uh, were actually the subject of an impeachment bill, mm -hmm. um, introduced by somebody in the uh, state house. Um, and, uh, that didn't, didn't go anywhere. Um, 
after we decided the case, then somebody thought of, well, why don't we ask Judge Weck to re Justice Weck to recuse himself? It's a little bit late. Um, uh, but I wrote an opinion on, on why I denied that. Uh, of course, it was a little too late since we had already decided it. Uh, we were drawing the maps at that point. So if you're interested in reading, you can, you know, you can research that and find my opinion. And I, because I, I talked about some of the SCOTUS precedent out there, including the Hennepin County case uh, and some other stuff. It was kind of fun and interesting to work on. Um, Weren't you only also required to file something uh, about con addressing conflicts of interest? Uh, Did I read that correctly? I can't, well, we often had to. Um, In that case. We, um, we often made disclosures, disclosures about campaign contributions, right, my colleagues and I. Uh, which is another thing that doesn't come up in the federal context, of course, um, whether you're up for election or up for retention, uh, it's often the case that, that you feel the need to write a disclosure letter to counsel saying, right. hey, everybody, you know, Smith gave me X dollars, Brown gave me X, uh, Y dollars. If anybody has a motion they'd like to bring, feel free and I'll evaluate it. And um, so that's, that's the kind of thing that goes on, too. Um, the... the um, the, uh, I, I was just thinking about this as Judge Jones was talking. Ironically, ironically, it may be, see, we always think, I mean, most of us think, of course, that the, that the selection of the federal judges under our United States Constitution uh, is more conducive to independence because um, they're appointed for life uh, and they don't have to run and they don't have to get campaign contributions. By the way, most times I've been in this room, I've been a candidate for an appellate court. <laughs> um, and I was telling Judge Schwab beforehand, the first time was when I ran against my friend Judge Stabil for the Superior Court in 2011, and the entire room was Judge Stabile and me, uh, Professor Geddes, who was the moderator, uh, Pete DeCourcy, who's uh, unfortunately uh, gone now, who was a great reporter, yeah. and a cameraman, and that was the whole crowd. It was Halloween afternoon, and students didn't want to be bothered. So I'm really heartened to see so many people. <laughs> but I was just thinking, as Judge Jones was talking, Ironically, it may be now that the vetting of um, the federal the, the, the federal judges by the, the presidential nominating authority is so meticulous, apparently from what I read and, and uh, what apparently goes on now, I, I, you know, this is not partisan, whatever party the president is, the, the effort now apparently is to have a known quantity. A known quantity, um, at least at the uh, United States uh, Supreme Court level. Just, well, but but I, but I think um, at the circuit level too, um, the Court of Appeals and SCOTUS. So, the irony, I I think, might be. I just want to suggest the possibility that, ironically, um, since in a, in a state like Pennsylvania, where the the independence of the appellate jurist is often impugned by virtue of the fact that we must be elected and raise money. Um, because one could be elected on the strength of, of extraneous factors other than sheer fidelity to a political allegiance, um, maybe able to raise a lot of money, maybe success on the campaign trail for whatever other reason, uh, you're, maybe you're more likely to get a, a wild card, so to speak, on the state appellate bench uh, in such a state like Pennsylvania, then you are to get a wild card these days anymore on a U.S. Court of Appeals or SCOTUS. Well, uh, Professor Domino writes about this in that. In, he studies it. I'm just uh, 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 Yeah, this. no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> You talk about maybe not having an open-minded jurist, maybe having an open-minded jurist is not so much of a good thing because it uh, shows they haven't thought about anything. Do we, do, do, <laughs> or something like that, I can't. Well, it, it, sure, it just depends on what one means by open-minded. And now I had, I had some prepared remarks for this. Um, but when I came in and showed them to Judge Schwab, she ripped them up. And <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's really good. Good one, good one Mike. Yeah, good that one. was good. <laughs> now, at a certain level, it's, I think it's, it's indisputable 
that having someone whose mind is completely open about basic subjects is not open-minded so much as unqualified. Uh, we expect and, I think, deserve as citizens of a, a free republic that the people who are implementing the law will, will have enough of a familiarity with the law as to do a competent job. And an uh, and, and, and essential aspect, I think, of doing a competent job is not being entirely open-minded, not having your mind be completely empty. We want someone who's going to say, gee, I wonder whether the federal judiciary has the power to declare laws unconstitutional. I think I should be open on that topic. No, you shouldn't be open on that topic. You should be completely closed. You should recognize that you don't have discretion on that question. The question's been decided by somebody else. It's been decided for 200 years, and it's not your job to do something else. So I think that, I think that a proper, uh, properly behaving judge whether on the federal bench or the state bench, recognizes the appropriately limited role that that judge has. And part of that recognition, I think, is an understanding that not every topic is new under the sun and not every solution is within the realm of possibility for that judge. I'm going to turn to Judge Mahonsing. Uh, you are a different kind of judge. We are different kinds of judges, right? We're let, let us call us merit-selected judges. Uh, for those of you who don't know how magistrate judges are selected, we're selected uh, by the board of judges of our court. So Judge Jones, for example, and, and, and his other district court colleagues, they select the magistrate judges of the court. And let me tell you, there's a, when these positions are open, right, there's a lot of people. It's not unusual to have a hundred people, uh, attorneys, apply for these positions. I might say we do a good job, don't we? Ah, very good. That was good. That was good. I didn't pay him for that. Never mind. But so, Judge Mahonchik, uh, how do you view, because not only are you uh, selected by the Board of Judges, but our, what m most of our work is, uh, unless we get c cases on consent, is report and recommendation to a district judge. H how do you see this topic for you as being independent? So say you have a case, I mean, we've all had this, a case for a district judge, say Judge Jones, but he's written on the same topic. H tell me what you do. You act as an independent judicial officer. You don't just and cite his cases back to You don't just him? cite his cases, no, with all due respect. I understand. Uh, <laughs> um, do, you, do you criticize them remorselessly? I, I, I try not to do that either. Oh, you have this. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I try to strike a good judicial temperament in that. Um, and well, and we've talked about this. We've had calls uh, among the magistrate judges, particularly when there are issues that have come up, um, and it sort of goes to Professor Domino's point as well that you know it's not a completely blank slate. We have these issues out there decided by uh, the district judges, but we are independent judicial officers. We are bound by the same judicial canons, and the commentary to Canon One says that we should act without fear or favor, and our integrity and independence really relies on that, and that comes. Uh, into play with uh, doing the report and recommendations as well. You know, we've, we do not, I do not draft my recommendations based on who the district judge is. Um, I draft them based on what I think the precedent is. And we may have some cases or some issues in our court, and we, we've had one recently, where some of the district judges decided one way and some decided the other way, and the Third Circuit has now made a decision, and now we know what we're bound by. But that's, um, now, when we talked about that on our call, you know, someone said, well, hey, should we do this based on who the district judge is? And I said, no, that's not, you know, that's not our role. So we have not only the issue of judicial independence vis-a-vis um, -vis the public and the public opinion of us, but that is also a concern um, because we, and I don't say concern because I think, I don't think it's a concern in our court necessarily, but I sit on a, a group in D.C. with the AO, and it has been raised by my colleagues across the country that there is a concern about decisions magistrate judges make impacting their ability to be, to be reappointed to their to a second term or third term, uh, and not just with reports and recommendations, but even on uh, decisions of detention at arraignments. So, All right, interesting. Uh, I, in case people don't know, we we are appointed for eight year terms, and then we ha have to be reappointed. So that. But I think it's the same. You know, as with everyone else on this panel, it's the same. 
uh, idea that you, you, know, you say to yourself, you're an independent judicial officer and you're acting without concern about fear or favor and you have to make the decision that you think is right based on the law that you have in front of you. Justice Weck, I'm, you and I haven't talked about this, but we had a case where you now have dissented to the position I took in the federal court. Uh, yeah, I need to talk to you about that later. <laughs> the Mavifrol? No, the Scott versus Travelers Insurance. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, Mavifrol. yes, yeah. Yeah, recently I've had some dissents um, in connection with a motor vehicle financial responsibility law uh, here. And, uh, but that, I, me, I, you know, I... I read the statute. I don't get to write the statute, and um, and it's like um, um, Justice Holmes said in the federal context: if Congress wants to take us straight to hell, it's my job to help them get us there. <laughs> so um, the fact that you or I might want the statute to say something else doesn't mean, uh, in my view, that I get to rewrite the statute. So that's been the basic source of some of my recent dissents. That, that but was, Judge Schwab and her colleagues have to apply. Obviously, have to in in a diversity case or a pendant, you know, jurisdiction case, they have to apply the law, the Pennsylvania law espoused by the majority. So um, that was a b interesting it, talk about judicial independence. That was an interesting case because I got it on consent as a magistrate judge. Yet there was a district judge in in the Eastern District who went the other way, and I really had to think about that. Like, here's a district judge that thinks it's this way, and yet I went sort of the way of an Allegheny Court of Common Pleas judge. So it was a lot of judges in this mix, in, in this interpreting this statute, and then they appealed my ruling to the uh, Third Circuit, but because it was an issue that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court hadn't decided, the Third Circuit certified well, it over to your court. In that, in that one, I think, um, yeah, so, so what Judge Schwab's talking about is of course, as probably most of you know, the um, the federal courts, when they're trying to apply pencil, when they have to apply Pennsylvania law, you know, because of diversity or pen jurisdiction or what have you, they they sometimes have to predict what we would do if we haven't yet decided the question. So eventually, what what happens uh, from time to time is it goes up to the Third Circuit and they certify and ask us to decide and we we never say no it's an obvious matter of comedy we always say yes we, you know we'll decide that so i think the one you're talking about is bar is it it's not barnard i mean yours there were two been. that were consolidated one yeah. was called scott versus uh, travelers insurance and it was whether or not the insur it was an insurance company issue on on uh damages and whether they had to go for imes independent medical oh, exams yeah so that yeah so, because yeah. there well, was I mean, another it wasn't one like where this I, it certainly wasn't with these issues Judge Shells is talking well, about. Well, no, no, it, it leads but to it leads to yeah. these, these bizarre circumstances, though. Uh, and it, uh, without getting wonky or excessively inside baseball, a couple of years ago I, I had a case uh, that involved the restatement, uh, and I think it predated your time on the on the Product, Supreme Court. Products. Oh yeah, pro and products and. And so the Third Circuit had predicted that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court would would uh, embrace and adopt the Restatement Third as it as it came to uh, products liability. Now, in the interim, after that decision, uh, the uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, decided a case, tincher, and, you, and you t it was Tincher. Uh, and 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 of course, there there was a <laughs> there was a clear ability by the court to embrace uh, the Restatement Third, and the court didn't do it uh, uh, at that time. So, uh, you know, um, foolish judge, I, I get this case, and I look and I see the Third Circuit's predicted restatement third, but I see the interim case where they clearly can take a, they, they took a swing at this and they're stuck on second, uh, fine, you know, good reasoning in the case, and, and so I, I stay with second. Uh, and I say, despite the Third Circuit's prediction, um, you know, it appears to me, uh, you know, I'm I'm not that deep, I guess. I thought, you know, they they had a chance, and they they appear that they're going to stay with second. The case is appealed up to the Third Circuit, and my friend Judge Fisher, uh, uh, writing for the panel, said basically, "We told you it was third, <laughs> and it's <laughs> and it's third. And we don't care what you say, and we don't care what the Supreme Court said in the interim. We're sticking with our prediction." Now. You know, it doesn't always happen that way, but but there, you, you, when you talk about an independent judiciary and and there's there is comedy uh, between state and federal courts, but every once in a while you get these these up and down um, uh, kind of acts of jujitsu uh, uh, that uh, that become a little numbing, uh, 
And where are you, Justice Walker? Are you at second or third? We're at second. So I, I, thought I, so. I assume. See, I was right. I was right. Well, you were. I, I'm not familiar with that. I mean, I, I think I remember it's reading about, about yours, a, but not the Third Circuit's reversal, which seems curious. But, um, but I assume in the meantime, the Third Circuit has read Tincture and recognizes we're second. Yeah, they're quiet about it now. Yeah. I think they're. I think they've they've settled this down. This is good right. for law students because they read about the restatement now. Well, read about we it. We actually are talking well, about, about the restatement. It, well, it's Tincture. Well, it's tincture as an ALI member, I can tell you that. You know, 95% of what the ALI down, it does down there is, you know, highly er esoteric and irrelevant. But um, it's not, you know, not the days of Judge Henry Friendly. But, uh, but uh, you know, there is still some stuff that comes up, and, and um, especially in torts, that we, we uh, use the restatement, you know. So, so uh, Judge Jones, let me ask you, and then go, what... What steps do you take in your everyday practice to ensure uh, that you maintain your impartiality, your independence? I think I think you you're wired that way, uh, and and I think good judicial officers um, you, you you tune it out uh, and and you do your, you keep your head down, and you do your job. Um, uh, I've got two of my great clerks here, and they know uh, that. Uh, uh, we're there, and I, I say this, it, it sounds perhaps trite, but we're there to do justice. And, uh, and, and in the end, that's what it's all about. Uh, and I also um, uh, am prone to reminding uh, those who work with me that, uh, um, you know, I remember when I was uh, in the practice, it, it's, it's fresh in my mind, despite the fact that I've been on the bench a, a fairly long time. And I know that when someone has a, a, a legal dispute, uh, because I represent a lot of people, thousands of people over a 22-year legal career, that the first thing they thought about in the morning when they woke up was their lawsuit, mm -hmm. the case that they were enmeshed in. And the last thing that they thought about typically when they put their head on the pillow at night before they fell asleep was the lawsuit that they were enmeshed in. And it's well to never forget that when you're a judge. Now, we have corporations, of course, and we have... Uh, uh, entities that are that are not uh, living and breathing people, but a lot of them are, you know, on our docket. And I and I try to hold fast to that, and and remember uh, that uh, we we ought never be cavalier uh, about how we do that. And if you if you hold fast to that as kind of a pole star, uh, you know, you you're gonna you're gonna do all right uh, as a judge, and 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 tune out, you know, a lot of the the uh, the outside sort of white noise. Justice Weck, do you agree? Yeah, uh, I generally generally I agree with Judge Jones on everything. And by the way, if you want to get a um, more expansive view of some of his great wisdom, read his chapter in a book uh, called "Blindfolds Off" by our mutual friend Joel Cohen, um, where uh, Mr. Cohen uh, interviews great judges, and each has a chapter, and he has a great interview chapter of Judge Jones. Um, so. I was reminded of that epic exchange between Holmes and Hand this, almost a century ago. So learned Hand, the greatest judge never to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States, went to lunch with Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., probably the greatest justice. Um, and Hand drops Holmes off by the court. And he, at this point, Holmes is 90 some years old and he goes hobbling down the walkway. And, and Hand shouts out, farewell, sir, do justice. And Holmes wheels around and starts coming back, and Hand says, I know, I know. And Holmes says, that's not my job. My job is just to play the game by the rules. So um, Judge Jones referred to doing justice. I would say that um, to me, um, I, I don't disagree with that in one sense, but to me, um, justice is a process, it's not a result. So uh, we can all agree on, well, we, we, we can all disagree on results, but we should always be able to agree on process. In other words, agree on what the rules are. We don't know what a fact finder is going to do. We certainly don't know what a jury is going to do. But we ought to be able to agree on the rules. And Frankfurter often said that, that the history, and Holmes too, that the, the history of the history of justice has, to a large extent, been the history of procedure. So, um, uh, it, you know, another just another way of looking at this. When I took the bar exam, I took it in New York because uh, I didn't think I'd want to come home to Pennsylvania. So I took the bar exam in New York, and uh, 
I took it live, these live lectures. And the criminal procedure professor was a Nobody guy even Charles. knows what these are anymore. Uh, yeah, Those well, live They don't ones. know that. No, but, no. Well, we, we had a town hall in, in Midtown, and, and this guy named uh, Charles Whitebread, that was his name. He was the um, teacher, uh, professor at USC Law School, taught criminal procedure. And he said something. I had no idea for years what he meant, but he looked at us and he said, remember, don't love them, don't hate them, just hose them. I had no idea what he meant. For years, I had no idea what he meant. Years later, I became a judge, and I realized what he meant. He meant don't get emotionally involved in the case. Just apply the law remorselessly. Just apply the law, as Judge Jones said, without, or Judge Mahalchik said, somebody said, without fear or favor, part of our oath. It, and if you are emotionally involved, or if you have a connection with a party that you know, commits you loyalty-wise or something, then just get out of the case. There's and, other and, judges. And, and justice is process. And, and, and you're, you're quite right. And we, yeah. we do agree um, with my, I do agree with my great friend, uh, Justice Wecht, on, on virtually everything. And I, and, and I meant to, to say, uh, and I think you picked up on this, that it's processed very frequently um, because you can't get invested in that. You know, the, 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 the path leads to a result that um, you, you may personally feel badly about, but but that's the way it goes. Uh, and and uh, uh, but but it's a process. And when you do justice, you you give them the right process, but uh, but not necessarily uh, the result that you might have hoped for at the beginning of the uh, of the process. We're all too human, right? And we understand um, how we might want emotionally a case to come out. But that's the white noise that you have to filter out when you when you decide cases. And you have to be prepared. Um, to, to, to disturb and disappoint people who were your supporters. Whether you're on the federal bench or on the state bench, somebody helped you, many somebodies, many somebodies, many important somebodies helped you get there. And you have to be prepared to disappoint them. I can assure you, I, I at least imagine, that there are many, many people uh, very disturbed with some of these writings I've made in the mivifral area lately. Uh, I can't think about that. The minute I think and worry about who I'm disappointing is the minute I have to retire and go, go make some money like some of you lawyers in the room. Uh, I, and I don't know the answer to this, so I'm kind of asking this blindly, but as an elected judge, how do you make, how do you make the decision when to recuse? Because so, I'm sure you get money from all sorts of... Uh, spheres. Yeah, the election uh, in which I ran in 2015 and was elected was reported to be the most expensive judicial election in American mm -hmm. history. I think the there were seven of us running in the general election, and I think the total raise was over 15 million. I think if I read that correctly, at least according to the Brennan Center at NYU, which doesn't like any of this. Um, but the, but there's a lot of things they don't like. But I think they're probably <laughs> accurate. But um, so the, the, there is no, in Pennsylvania, there is no specific dollar amount. There are some states that have a dollar amount, uh, but to answer your question, Judge, there are two questions we must ask ourselves. Uh, one is, um, can I be fair and impartial? Even if I can say, yes, I know I can be fair and impartial, that's not enough. I also have to... I also have to candidly answer the question, will I nonetheless appear to be something less than fair and impartial, a reasonable person's standard? Going to and, this appearance of impropriety in the canons? Yes. Uh, if, if there's an appearance, um, and, and, and you, you, one might say, well, well that's self-serving. Uh, it, it is self-serving. Why? Because the judge... Is the, is, the, is the decision maker on his or her own recusal. And obviously it's subject to review, uh, in our case only, um, I suppose, on some con federal constitutional uh, magnitude uh, in the nature of habeas or something of that nature. But um, at all levels of the, of the judicial system, uh, at least in the first instance, the recusal issue is for the jurist involved. Um, disclosure is very important. So my practice has been to be uh, overabundantly, uh, uh, to, to make an abundance of disclosure, uh, but 
uh, we're also cautioned, and I think it's the same in the federal context, to be um, circumspect about recusing un with undue frequency because mm -hmm. some other judge has to do it. Right. Uh, and also, a litigant does not get to manufacture the conflict. When I, I, um, the judge mentioned I was a family court judge for many years, um, so I would have, um, th there's a fair amount of emotion in family court, and Judge Wren knows that. Um, so, um, you know, often you have very angry litigants, um, so there were, uh, and angry lawyers, um, and there were times when somebody would manufacture the ac acrimony and then use that as a lever to try to get a judge to recuse. So you don't get to manufacture right. the conflict. Right. So no discussion about uh, judicial independence would be complete without a reference to Alexander Hamilton, who said in Federalist 78 that the judiciary is the least dangerous branch because it held neither the purse strings of the legislature nor the force of the executive. The judiciary wielded merely judgment. Professor Domino, what, what does this mean? I think are we the overall, really the weakest branch? Well, you are in, in that sense, that you, you have neither force nor will, but, but merely judgment. I think what it means for judicial independence is that independence is not an unqualified good. Overall, it has very many good qualities. In fact, it may be essential to a functioning system with a, of justice. But it's not an unqualified good, and it's not an unqualified good. The reason it isn't is because that judicial independence conflicts with some ideals of democracy. Those of you who've studied the place of the judiciary in the American system of government will hear not only the phrase, uh, the least dangerous branch, but will also hear the phrase, the counter-majoritarian difficulty. And what that means is that in our system of democracy, the people's branches that is, the political branches, the legislature and the executive, get to make laws only insofar as the judiciary lets them. <laughs> that they can make laws, the democratic process can work so far, but then the judiciary stops in and says, you've gone too far. You've exceeded your, your constitutional authority and we have to cut you back. If the courts are completely independent, or to the extent that they're independent, there's a risk that they undermine that value of, of democracy. And so the judiciary is the least dangerous branch because it can't enforce its judgments. But it's, it's also uh, uh, deliberately made weak in that respect. It's deliberately made dependent on the other branches of government to some extent because the framers also worried about the the danger of a too powerful judiciary. And yet there was a recent Seventh Circuit case. It was in, uh, I'm gonna, I didn't, uh, are you, do you know what You're I'm talking, talking about? The Easterbrook opinion? Yes. Oh yeah, that Where was. they really s smacked down the yeah, yeah. executive branch because they totally did not do what they told them to do in the first instance. Well, t you know, t two things uh, about that. I, I think um, that, uh, that uh, Alexander Hamilton, um, who had a musical. Uh, I think so. It's going to be a movie. It's going to be a movie. Uh, and you can see the original yeah, cast. None of us have had a musical yeah. uh, done after us, but but the that the know. that we know of, uh, says Judge Mahalchuk. But <laughs> but I, I, I'm not sure. He I've been in musicals, but not. Uh, I I, th I think conceptually, and, and, and Professor Domino is a much better student uh, of history than I am. But I but I I don't know. That, that he could envision at the time he said that. Uh, it, 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 you could talk abstractly about co-equal branches of government, but I'm not sure the judiciary was, was viewed as that at the inception. Uh, the Supreme Court, is, is, as you know, Mike, was, was uh, not a, not a desire, desirable place to be uh, in the beginning. It was, it was sort of a place you got lost uh, in the beginning and uh, didn't have the prestige that it, it does today. But also, on the, you, you invoke uh, the subject of tonight's panel, which is judicial independence. I think that's a lamentable phrase, actually. Now, I serve as a co-chair 
on a, a Judicial Independence Commission uh, through appointment by uh, Justice Wecht and his, and his uh, colleagues uh, that's been around for about 15 years. I've been on it, uh, a charter member. I'm now co-chair of it. And we talk from time to time about the fact that it, it's really a misnomer because it implies uh, judges going rogue. It implies judges doing whatever they want, doesn't it? I mean, to the public. And we try to sell this. Then you know, I talk about the fact that that we are a co-equal branch, and then you you put that word independence in, and and it and it inflames people. The better word I always thought, although it, it it's not nearly as sexy, is to say judicial accountability. Um, you know, and as I said earlier, accountable to the laws and precedent and the Constitution. But we don't say that. Um, so I often wonder, in my idle moments, you know, whether we need to come up with a better phrase uh, than judicial independence. You know, it, we know intellectually what that means, uh, but I'm not sure that it's that easy for the public to embrace as a saleable concept to talk about uh, the, the integrity and the prestige and, and, and the, uh, whatever credibility the judiciary has. I'm, I'm not sure that it actually enhances our credibility sometimes with different uh, portions of the public. I don't know what my I think that's right, and the, I think mm -hmm. one of the reasons for it is that independence is inherently a relational concept. Yes. It's, it's independent in relation to what or independent from what. Right. And it's not said that way. It's well, just it sounds like we're untethered, blood. right? I That's mean. right. Yeah, independent from the other branches, independent from the voters, independent from the law. In, right. Some right. of that kind of independence is great and essential, and some of it's damaging. I, I, I would add, though, that um, I, although the, I think the counter-majoritarian dif um, difficulty wasn't coined until Bickle, I think, uh, it, 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 there, there is um, a, a very deep strain of resistance to what we do. Um, you know, going back, I mean, you know, as Jeremy Bentham observed, every law is an infraction of liberty. Think about it. Every law is an infraction of liberty. And, and, and this, you know, this was perpetuated in the Jeffersonian view. Uh, remember, Jefferson engineered the impeachment of Justice Chase, who, who in, did engage in some, some um, behavior we would not condone today, but, uh, but not at an impeachment level. In any event, the Senate did acquit him. But Jefferson was quite hostile um, to a lot of what we do in terms of judicial independence, in terms of our, um, our um, well, part of it was his animosity toward his cousin Marshall, of course. But, you know, this, this strain continued forward. And think of Jackson. Um, when Jackson, remember, uh, was president, and he sent the chair, he expelled the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears, and the Cherokee retained attorney, I think it was Davis, so the top lawyer at the time, whoever it was, and he went and got a writ from Marshall, a writ of prohibition, stopping Jackson from expelling the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears. And remember what Jackson said. He said, Marshall has his writ, now let him enforce it. Remember? And, and then when... Um, um, and, and then um, when Story um, issued the um, – Lincoln suspended habeas and disregarded Story's decision in Merriman. So fast forward all the way to Little Rock, right, uh, and Governor Faubus and, and, all, and all of these events at the schoolhouse door. It was very much a question, very much a question um, when there was massive resistance to integration uh, whether Brown v. Board would be enforced. Right. And really, it w wasn't until Eisenhower sent the National Guard and then JFK followed up by sending Katzen back. Uh, it wasn't, I would say, until then that we knew that the word of the federal courts would be enforced. So it was very much in doubt, I think, at least until that point in time. And it's never something to be taken for granted. OK, so whether it's, um, you know, legislators here moving to impeach justices of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court because they don't like a decision, or whether it's things that go on in the federal context attacking federal judges, we should, I don't think in this country we should ever take judicial independence for granted. These are, this is all, we could have a discussion for every one of these. It's getting late, and I know people have questions. I, I have more I can go over, but I'm gonna turn it over to the audience at the first instance here for, for some questions. Um, or shall I employ my eighth grade teacher and start calling on people? Ma'am. Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask the panel to comment. Uh, there was a judge in Allegheny County by the name of Mark Tranquilli, who was recently suspended by uh, j the president judge, Kim Berkeley Clark. He was meeting with the prosecutor and the defendant on a drug case, and he said that the prosecutor had made a terrible decision by allowing Aunt Jemima on the jury. He was referring to a black uh, woman who was wearing a hair wrap. He also said that he knows that the woman's baby daddy probably sells heroin and that her presumed bias in favor of heroin dealers had caused or contributed to the not guilty verdict. My question to you is, was Judge Clark correct in suspending him, and how would you handle that if you were in Judge Clark's shoes? I should be the first to comment on that because um, it's in our system. Um, and I will tell you, uh, A, that as you might expect, I'm very well aware of this. Uh, I'm not at liberty to tell you um, more than that, other than to say it's an active case in our judicial conduct system, uh, and the court on which I sit uh, ultimately has the, um, may become involved in that um, more openly, um, so I'm not able to comment. Uh, I, I'm not at liberty to make any comment uh, uh, other than to acknowledge that uh, I'm well aware of that case and that it is an active matter. But everybody else is well, I mean, none of you are I don't are know if it'll system. ever come before a federal court. Judge Mahalchik or Judge Jones, do you feel... Well, I, I will just say that I, th I think the, 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 the disciplinary system that, that has been set up by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania uh, is impressive to me, uh, and I, I have uh, I've watched it, uh, you know, from from afar, and it's uh, it, it you know, to my from my perspective, it works and it, and it works well. I'm, I'm not going to get into the merits of that case. I don't, you know, I respect your question, but it's a place I don't want to. I don't want to wade into it because I, I really don't know anything about it other than some things that I've read, but uh, but I have great faith in the process. Thank you. And oh, I should yes. just I should just tell everybody, remember your constitution. Because remember, we don't just have the U.S. Constitution. We have a Pennsylvania Constitution, yes. which is older, which is older in its first iteration. Um, in its current iteration, the, US, the Pennsylvania Constitution, in the Constitution, not just in the Constitution, not just our rules, has a judicial conduct board and a court of judicial discipline. So your constitution has mechanisms that exist to address what you're talking about. Uh, and the matter you're talking about is, is in the initial, I'll just say it's according to media reports, I won't tell you what's internal in the court. I will say in the media, one can read that it's the matter is in the opening stages of that constitutional process. Thank you. you, you Ma'am. What do you feel is the greatest threat to judicial independence today, and what role, if any, should lawyers play in help assuring that, that, that the judiciary remains independent? Judge Mahalchik, why don't you take this one? Or defend sure. them in their independence. Sure. I think the, the greatest threat to, to that is really a lack of education. And the, the thing that lawyers can do and, and frankly, uh, the bench can do uh, in all aspects is join in education of not just each other but also of the public. And I think that judges remaining involved in appropriate, appropriate bar associations and community organizations and giving presentations like this one tonight and talking to lawyers about uh, the topic of judicial accountability or judicial independence, whatever you want to call it, um, and, and educating not just lawyers, but also lawyers and judges going out to classrooms, um, to elementary schools and middle schools and high schools and colleges and law schools, and talking about uh, the issue as well is the best way to counter that. And to continue to remain in our own actions, uh, you know, as we have to, to adhere to those canons of judicial conduct and act without fear or favor and act independently uh, and with um, open minds that are also educated and that I think there's a difference between an open mind and a vacant mind and um, you know and 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 doing so and and being very candid and and open about that process but I think education and communication between the bench and bar and the community is key and the, and the most powerful weapon in fighting uh, that. That's really right. And, you know, I think for years judges had the luxury 
of uh, sort of uh, hiding behind chambers doors and mm -hmm. and that that's gone that day is gone and uh now you know there are some Im judges who are better ambassadors than others uh uh, to get out and speak on these things. If you don't have a passion for it, you shouldn't do it because it shows. And, I, and I'm not knocking a jurist who doesn't want to get out and, and, uh, and talk about what we do in the business of judging. But, uh, but I think we need to engage. And you mentioned lawyers. Uh, lawyers need to um, talk about the process and the system too. And I don't mean that lawyers should be uh, uh, basically uh, uh, touts or cheerleaders for judges, but they should uh, uphold the integrity of the judiciary. We have a uh, we have a tough situation today, and and I don't want to wade into partisan politics, and that's not my purpose, and I know that's not why we're here. But I think the rhetoric uh, that is coming from some quarters is damaging. Uh, I, I lament it, um, as uh, Justice Wex said. There's a long history of presidents disagreeing with the decisions uh, uh, that uh, goes through uh, all the examples and more that he said. But I have to tell you that. Um, when we have uh, a leader uh, who uh, disagrees with a decision of a judge and then says that he wants to look into that judge uh, and, and uh, his background, um, and, we, and we, become, uh, we go from uh, decisional uh, criticisms to ad hominem attacks, then I think we have a problem. And I think the bar and, and bar associations have a responsibility to step in uh, and, and help us uh, and talk about these things. So I think we're all in this together. It's the legal system. It's not just the judiciary. Can I just add one thing yeah, to that? Sure. And, um, sure. Because I think the point Judge Jones made is very important. I, I want to take advantage of the fact that we have uh, lawyers and future lawyers here to um, suggest that it would be um, very good to keep in mind that uh, lawyers have a role to play in defending judicial independence uh, and um, that judges are constrained by our, co our codes of conduct from uh, saying everything that we might say in response to criticism. And as was suggested by my colleagues, it's not about, you know, criticizing this. We're big boys and girls, and, and you know, I, you know I, I personally don't care what people say about me, but it's about the process. And the, the problem is that if lawyers don't step up and defend the courts, then that every time um, the rule of law is defied, uh, it erodes our system a little bit more. And that weakens the system for future generations. And, and, and lawyers have a special duty uh, to step forward and, 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 and educate the public about the process and why the alternative to the system we have that generates decisions that we can disagree with from time to time uh, is, is effectively, uh, as Frankfurter said, first chaos and then tyranny. I'd also like to reinforce some of that with uh, particular regard to the, the value of education of the public and the community. But I think that, that part of the source of the attacks on the judiciary for, for in a partisan kind of way, comes from an, an undue focus on the Supreme Court of the United States and, and an assumption that all judges behave that way. If all you know about the court system is the Supreme Court of the United States, well then you think, if you're a casual observer, that everything that judges do all the time is deciding death penalty, abortion, and affirmative action cases. Right. And you think that all they do is deciding policy kinds of questions. And you think that the law that they're interpreting is rather vacuous and doesn't uh, constrain decisions. And you see decisions break down on predictable party lines all the time. Part of, I think, what the educational focus should be is that the judicial system is far more than the Supreme Court of the United States, and the judiciary is far more than the nine justices on the Supreme Court. Judicial decision making is, as Judge Jones said uh, much earlier in the hour, uh, at the lower levels depends far less on the kinds of uh, uh, partisanship in the sense that, that judicial decisions are far less able to be predicted on the basis of the uh, party of the appointing president when you're looking at the, the vast majority of decisions that are made by, by the federal or state judiciary. Oh, that's a really, really good point because most of what we do every day is what Judge Carlson always says is retail justice. Uh, and and one la I'll take one last question. 
Somebody has to have one or I'm gonna, oh, I have one over here. Is there a proper way to proceed as attorneys if there is an instance where a judge makes up their own rule or uses a non-applicable rule? And what, how would you recommend that as attorneys we do proceed in that kind of situation? Appeal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but before you appeal, hypothetically, before you appeal, move, move, for, move, move for reconsideration. Yeah. I, when I was a trial judge, true. Uh, I, I was happy to receive a motion for reconsideration. Uh, if I was wrong, I'd rather correct it um, than have to do the whole appellate process and then get a remand. That's a, that's a good point. I mean, I. I, I, I made a, a very flippant answer, and I didn't mean to do that. But I, I well, actually, I did mean to do that. But, I, but, I, <laughs> I, but I, 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 it, we can get it wrong, and and I have frequently granted motions to reconsider where I've simply missed something, and and respectfully call it to the attention of the of the judge, and and you know you just point it out. You may have missed something. Uh, it's how you do it uh, sometimes, you know. Um, uh, you avoid the word stupid, uh, yeah. um, but but I but I think you'll get a fair hearing with, with any responsible jurist. Certainly more effective than writing a law review article. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I apologize. I should have been a little more specific. I was actually thinking in more of a situation without the statutory right of appeal in certain interlocutory kind of situations. Again, again, the, the motion for reconsideration I think works. Uh, you know, if you're if you're in a if you're in a bind that you can't take it up. Obviously, I think that's what you do. I agree with Justice Wack. I think, I think we have to draw this to a close, but my goal here, I think, has been achieved, which is going back to, I think, what you just said, Professor Domino, which is um, we're not the Supreme Court of the United States. I mean, we have Justice Wack, of course, as, as the highest court in our commonwealth, but we are human beings that do a job of judging every day and take our jobs seriously and respect our jobs and... Um, respect our colleagues, and I think, uh, hopefully we've demonstrated that here tonight, that um, we take our, the role that we have and our mandate to be impartial and independent and accountable very seriously, and I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight and, and, and uh, traveling all the way, and I really, really appreciate it, and thank you all for coming as well, and I think we have to wrap. This is a wrap. Thank you.